Hey everybody, Edo here, and I am excited because I have Justin Marty. He's a CPA working for Ander CPA. Say hello, Justin. Hello. And, you know, I've been trying to expand the group of people that I have on these Q&As, and I was excited because Justin happens to be um, my CPA, but he's also somewhat, I, I don't know if there is a specialty in board game Kickstarter creator CPAs, but... I learned about him through jo uh, through Jamie uh, at Stonemeyer Games. So, I mean, Justin, just to kick it off, how did you? Was it with Jamie? How did you get into specifically working with Kickstarter creators and board game creators? Well, actually, it all started basically with with Jamie from uh, Stonemeyer Games. Uh, he contacted our firm and engaged us to help with the accounting and uh, tax preparation of his initial uh, business tax return. So that's that's where it all started. You know, we basically took over and we did the full year of accounting and helped with the preparation of the actual uh, tax return. And uh, basically, we did a good job. We discussed everything with with Jamie, and he ended up uh, writing some, a blog and, and put it on his Kickstarter page, in which he he referenced you know my name and email. Yeah, and has led to quite a bit of clients, including yourself. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, and I mean, I love working with startups. I mean, here at Anders, we have a startup niche, which focuses directly on startups. And I'm one of the core members in that group. So uh, I love working with startups. You know, they, they really appreciate your services just because they know <laughs> yeah. how to help them and everything like that. So, yeah, and, 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 and certainly I, I, I will. You know, uh, J Jamie saying he praises. I think it was Kickstarter lesson number four. But if you look up his accounted financing, he's got lots of information there, including Justin's email. I I I I'll add it as well. But the, um, you know, working with you guys has been great, and it's sort of what I would consider that personal touch um, that you've provided in terms of supporting me and helping me understand how best to manage my finances. And I think you know, for the most part, since you know you're, you know, I, I don't know how much we want to dive into sort of how you got into being a CPA. Um, but what I think everyone would be interested in is some basics on account, you know, how to, how to manage their Kickstarter business. And, and I, you know, again, obviously we don't need to get into tons of specifics here, but you know what, if I'm, if I'm about to do a Kickstarter, right, I'm, 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 you know, just some random Joe and I've decided to make a board game Kickstarter one other one. And I'm, I've made that decision. I'm about to start a bunch of stuff. What would you say are the things I should keep in mind from that point immediately um, as I get into it? All right. So, you know, first thing first, you know, you're going to have your, you know, you're going to create your idea. So, uh, and that's going to, you know, start your, your thinking process. But, sure. You know, in regards to the business aspect, your first thing to think about would be entity, entity selection, which is something you do not take lightly at all. Uh, and that's choosing whether you want to be a sole proprietorship, uh, an LLC, S Corp, regular C Corp. And, and every every circumstance is different. So, you know, I advise to, you know, either consult a lawyer or your, your CPA when making that decision. Uh, and then, you know, once you get that business entity uh, picked out. Uh, you also want to set up separate accounts for that bank accounts to make sure that you those funds are deposited into that correct account. Uh, and then you know. Well, let, me just hold, let me just let me just hold you on those two um, before you keep going. Um, those are, are really big decisions. I can't tell you how many people ask me from the beginning. Well, should I be a sole proprietorship? Should I, you know, is it an LLC? What is a C corp? What are my different options? They all require a different amount of documents, different amount of 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 they, they cost different amounts. It's just like a state by state thing. There's a lot of decisions there, and you know whether you have friends or a CPA or using LegalZoom or whatever. I think it's important for somebody to to, to pick that out. Uh, for those curious, Pencil First Games is a sole proprietorship LLC. Um, a, a lot of it also comes down to whether or not you're going to have employees and other other partners or just you as a person. And that second point you brought up too, I just want to emphasize, um, people, I don't think people realize that as soon as possible you want to be tracking anything associated expense-wise with your company and your Kickstarter. Um, the sooner, I mean, you could just be tracking receipts and saving receipts in an Excel sheet, but the sooner you can just have... Uh, your own credit card, your own bank account, and those things for that company, 
the easier it is to, to sort of split and be able to talk about your business versus your, you know, taking your family out to dinner. And that, that's a huge headache saver, uh, I would say. Oh, definitely, definitely. And, you know, in order to, to set up basically a bank account in your company's name, you're going to have to get a tax identification number. And the, the bank won't usually set up an account in a company name until they get that. So, I mean, and it's, you know, you know, you, you don't ever want to think about going through an IRS audit. But if you ever do have to go through that, having a separate account for business-only transactions is, is huge. And and like you said, you know, if, just backtracking a little bit, in regards to setting up the entity, uh, you know, you've got to think about so many different things, too, not just, you know, the tax consequences of that entity. you got to think about liability. You know, LLCs protect you. You know, it, it's, it's kind of like a separate entity, like a corporation is completely... <laughs> You know, it's independent of its owners, you know. So now if you have a partnership that's not an LLC, you know, the partners could be liable, you know, to, uh, to any type of lawsuits, anything like along those lines. So it, it's definitely a, a, a process that needs to be thought through when, when selecting a business. So and that uh, might- in like you said, it's huge costs. Corporations are more expensive to set up versus... Yeah. You know, so there's there's a few things you need to focus on. And, and I, I would say that people over overlook that liability piece. One of the things you need to keep in mind is once you become a business, once you're sending board games around the world, once you're doing all this stuff, there's all sorts of things that can happen. Even with Kickstarter, they're pretty much a, a, a flow through in terms of, you know, you know, if you misrepresent on Kickstarter or you get people's money and you don't do anything with you, they've made it more possible for people to sort of respond to that uh, towards the company and not that anyone set out to do something bad but having some uh, protections in place so you're not suddenly uh, you know at risk as an individual is a pretty big deal yeah um, uh, and oh, go ahead oh yeah I mean in regards to that you know you don't want to think about anybody ever doing you know doing that and having an intention of doing that but you know even setting up maybe an LLC if, if that LLC is Engage just basically to to get that money from individuals and not do anything with it. You know there might be some some legal action that those individuals might be able to take against that LLC owner. You know because he's basically that individual is acting on their behalf. You know so sure. it might not protect you. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. If you if you it's not going to not if you're over the top so. not if you're over the top. And nor yeah. am I recommending any such things. Anyway, I'm just saying there there are thing there are liabilities. And you mentioned an EI. EI EIN number for those who don't know basically when you create a company um, in your state and federally you get this identification number which I, I usually think of it as like a social security number it basically gets used like that so when you're setting something up or, 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 or you're filling out a form almost anything that's business related you end up using that number and I you know it's a unique identifier um, but so that that's something you'll get in addition to your company. Yeah, and that, it, you can you can file for that online, and it probably takes about ten minutes. So I mean, that is something really <laughs> easy to do. So uh, that is nothing that you know business new business need to spread over you know spread over. So that is, I mean, like I said, it's it's a ten minute thing. You basically just got to know what type of entity you are. You know, whether it's single member LLC partnership, you know, S corp or C corp. You right. know, so. All right, so, uh, so you were going through your litany. We, you talked about um, setting up the company, separating your finances. What else do you think um, is good to do up front as you're jumping into the, the Kickstarter game? All right, yeah, I mean, another good thing is to track everything. Record keeping is huge. And, you know, if you have, if you can talk to your CPA up front and kind of get an idea of what they are expecting from you, it could save so much money when it comes to filing your tax return. Uh, so basically, you know, not just tracking, you know, your total expenses, but being able to, to be able to break those out and categorize those according to, you know, office, cost of goods sold, uh, meals and entertainment, travel, uh, any type of startup expenses, which is, you know, your advertising, any type of pre-production cost before you actually have that game developed. Uh, track is huge just because it does save so much money. I mean, at the end of the day, if, if the C, your CPA has to go back 
and basically complete the entire year of accounting to reconcile all the banks, to, to determine what your ending inventory needs to be, what deferred revenue needs to be. I mean, that the bills add up quick. So Yeah, uh, and that was a, that was a lesson. Yeah, that was a lesson that I learned uh, with you guys, which was I, I had actually been keeping track of all the expenses and I had separate bank accounts, but I hadn't been intentionally categorizing them or any of that stuff. And so when, you know, I, I probably, you know, my, mis not, I don't know about mistake, but I ended up looking for a CPA after, um, like at right, right when I, I needed it <laughs> or really like it was, it was at the time it was the end of the year. And, uh, I was really conferred about confused about deferred revenue. You mentioned it. It's like a particular topic I want to, to mention to you, uh, to talk about, but before we do, so that's when I, I saw the, the Jamie post, I reached out, talked on the phone and looked at, um, you ended up having to do a lot of work pulling it all together. But after that first year, I now have this standing form that is exactly what you guys filled out that you provided to me, and that's something that I, some, sometimes on a monthly basis, but usually about a quarterly basis, I go in and I label all my expenses and the different categories and what they were, and it's so much easier when you're doing it together. When you're trying to remember this event and what convention was it, what, what was it in January or February and it's December, it can be a real pain. I, I, I also think as a business, it's useful to be doing that, to understand how you're spending money. Like, that's just good business. Um, but, so you mentioned, so, so um, before, okay, so I, I definitely want to talk about deferred revenue. Before we, were there any other key things that you would, you'd, you'd recommend before we get into, like, Q&A specific questions? I mean, I, I think that's the, the big talking points, you know, that, uh, you know, I encounter with uh, new businesses is, you know, the, the record keeping, you know, classification of expenses, uh, the accrual method of accounting is another one. I'm assuming we'll probably get into that. You know that uh, choosing your method of accounting is huge. You know that's that's something that you know is done from the initial return. Uh, so you definitely want to discuss that with your CPA. So that could, you know, especially in that initial year, uh, that can lead to huge tax consequences determining which method you're using. Well, so. yeah. Well, so let's jump right in because this was something that I, I, had, I didn't understand at all and I, I now do. But so there's um, two different ways you can, and I'll, I'll let you go through it, but a lot of Kickstarter creators are in this bind because they don't understand how, you know, when does money from a Kickstarter count as revenue because, it, you know, I, I get this huge chunk of money, say it's 50 grand from the Kickstarter but I, I haven't printed my stuff or fulfilled or it's falling, you know, I got the money in November. So I, I have this huge income, but no expenses to offset it. And so uh, I'm worried about my tax bill. And uh, what I didn't know is there's two types of accounting uh, you can do, but that you set it up for your company for like ever. I don't know if it's forever, but you're basically establishing how you, um, how you handle revenue and accounting from the beginning. So why don't you talk about deferred, uh, what you were just going into? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, you either have the, the cash method of accounting or the accrual method of accounting. Uh, and like you said, it's established from your initial return. You, you can go back and change the method of accounting by filing a form 3115. Uh, but that does, it is time consuming because you got to go back and figure out prior year numbers and whatnot. But uh, yeah, so basically with the, the cash method of accounting, the revenue is earned when the cash comes in. Costs are recorded basically when the cash goes out. Except for, for and inventory is a different item. And depending on how much inventory you have, you might have to use the approval method. But inventory, you know, and cost of goods sold, uh, those are basically tracked similar for, for both methods. But uh, for the accrual method, basically when you receive the cash, the revenue is not recorded until basically the goods or services performed under, under the accrual method. And the expenses are not recorded as expenses until those, those expenses occur. So basically it's kind of a min, uh, matching principle in regards to your revenues and cost of goods sold. So say your, your, your project is funded in December and none of your, your games have been under not being shipped to the, the following year. Uh, those products have not been shipped. They have not even been through the manufacturing process yet. So basically all those funds received 
would be going to a deferred revenue account, and that revenue will not be recognized until those goods are actually shipped the following year. And that's when you would also recognize your, your cost for producing those games, uh, which is all your manufacturing costs, any type of shipping costs, and, and any other costs associated with producing that product. So basically the, the accrual method can provide more of a matching uh, type principle there, where you're, you're recognizing your, your revenues from a project along with the cost of it sold at the same time, when the, the product is shipped or the services are performed. So, do you know, do you know um, out of curiosity, um, <clears throat> you know, before Kickstarters, what, you know, it, typically what is that used for? What kind of company typically uses that? Uh, the accrual method? Yeah. Uh, a lot of manufacturing clients, uh, distributors, I mean, they're, you, you name it, we, we have it. You know? <laughs> sure. So basically, clients across, across many different industries utilize the accrual method. Cool. Uh, you know, some, you know, professional services and all, the, uh, they, they usually utilize the, the cash method or require to, to, to use the, the cash method in certain circumstances. So, in most circumstances. So, uh, <coughs> Got you know, it. it depends on the, the industry, you know. Got it. So that that's a major major decision that you're going to be coming to as a creator. Uh, I'm I'm using the accrual method. I think you know if you're doing your first Kickstarter and it lands in the middle of the year, maybe you don't worry about it. But at the same time, if you're planning on doing lots of Kickstarters, you don't know when they're gonna when they're gonna fall. Um, and, and and you know now obviously I'm using a CPA, but I didn't think it was that much extra work to to have the information to do the accrual method. So that's that's definitely I hear that category of question a lot, um, and again I, I uh, for those who don't know I did a little Facebook post asking for people to have questions. So some of these are my questions, some of them are, are questions that people wrote. Another category I think has to do with um, contractors and people that you're you're paying uh, over over what is it six hundred dollars a year on on on. For, for for art or graphic design or, or whatever, not co in corporations but individuals. Can you, uh, Justin? Can you just give a, a brief a, a brief breakdown of what to keep in mind when you're using a contractor and what forms you're going to have to do and just just you know not not state specific but just a general outline. Yeah, I mean, basically, if you're you're paying an, a non incorporated unincorporated vendor to perform any services for you in excess of six hundred dollars, you have to issue them uh, a 1099. And under most circumstances, in this one, the circumstances you're talking about, that would be considered a non-employee compensation. So uh, basically, you, you would report that on the 1099, and you have to issue those to to those individual members or vendors uh, by January 31st of the following year that you paid them for their services. Right. So uh, the IRS is huge on on actually, you know, tracking this. I mean, the penalties are steep. For failing to file 1099s and for filing incomplete 1099s, so you know we recommend that you know each company track their, their payments to unincorporated vendors uh, for services provided. Uh, even if you know for for legal and, and everything, you know professional services. Some even if it's incorporated, you still need to issue them. Uh, a 1099 for so that's something else to, to keep in mind. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, tracking those costs are huge. And and, and and I'm not remembering the four. I want to say a W four, but uh, with individuals as a as a business, uh, you send them an initial form that you they give you like their social and a couple other pieces of information, their address for you to then do that filing. What what form is that? Is that the W four? I think it's W nine, I believe. Oh, w W nine. That's what it is. Yeah. So that's where you kind of you, it's your request for them to provide you all the information. Right. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, hopefully, you know, and you know, there are circumstances where sometimes you that individual might not return it to you. So you're at least doing your due diligence, trying to get that information from them. Right. So. Uh, but yeah, the, the big thing is tracking those costs per vendor. <coughs> Got it. All right, so we talked about deferred revenue. We talked about 1099. Um, something uh, a number of people were asking about was, and they, you know, some people talked about VAT, um, which is a, a tax in Europe. But 
you know, generally speaking, how do I think of what should I keep in mind when I'm thinking about international? I mean, just generally when doing, you know, whether I get my, my game manufactured internationally or I have a, a partner, international partner, you know, what, what are just the key things I should keep in mind? I mean, every, depending on where they're from, I mean, every circumstance is different. Uh, you know, we, uh, we have, we're part of this LEA Alliance group here at Anders where if we have any foreign questions, I mean, we always defer to them. And, you know, they, when they have U.S. questions, they come to us. Uh, you know, that's a, a big thing right now. Basically, uh, it's value-added tax. Uh, we currently do not have it here in the United States. The United States has more, it's basically like sales tax. For sure. Uh, so, you know, the, the VAT tax has anything to do with that. We kind of defer to uh, a firm within our LEA group. Uh, you know, for U.S. purposes, uh, you can deduct any VAT taxes that are, that are, that are paid to uh, these foreign countries. Uh, it's not a tax where you can take, you know, a foreign uh, income tax credit for because it's not an income type tax. It's, it's more along the lines of just like the value added tax. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, it must be paid. Uh, you know, it's basically a tax that you, you pay for production uh, of games, you know, right. or uh, or any type of products, you know, for the supplies used even in those, uh, in that production process. So, uh, you know, in, in regards to, to foreign uh, partners, I mean, that is, a, it's a big thing to think about solely because, you know, the United States, most of the time, they're going to require you to pay some type at the partnership, say at the entity level, some type of tax on that, that partner's behalf solely for the, the, the fact that the IRS doesn't want to take the risk of that foreign individual not filing their U.S. income tax return. So basically all, all, all the income earned here in the U.S., is, it's got to be taxed here, you know, either at corporate level or, uh, you know, if it's an S-Corp partnership, it's going to pass through to the, to the individual. So, uh, you know, that's a big thing to, to think about is, you know, are you going to have to pay tax at the entity level for that uh, individual foreign partner? Uh, and if, if, if you do, uh, and most of the time you will, uh, that is not a deductible tax for the, the entity. It is basically kind of treated as a, a distribution if it's a pass-through entity. Right. Uh, and then, of course, at the 1040 level, that, that foreign partner would pick up those withholdings. Right. Got it. Actually, while you were talking, I thought of one which is sort of non sequitur, but um, when I'm paying people for their services, is there any reason, I mean, you, you know, some people, you know, you just send them a check, which I think is, a, you know, the, the, the flag bearer, but, you know, a lot of times PayPal is being used more and more. As long as I report it at the end, does it matter? I mean, this may be a stupid question, but does it matter what payment service I'm using? Um as far as you're concerned, as long as I note it, or is there something I should keep in mind? I mean, I'm not 100% positive, but I, I don't believe there's, you know, as long as it's being tracked by you, uh, I believe that is probably enough information that, we, that we'll that need to prepare the, the 1099. I, off the top of my head, and I'm not 100% positive, I don't think there's any other additional reporting that's, that's required. Uh, you know, it's, it's just making sure that you're recording uh, the correct payments to each particular vendor. And and with those and, vendors, and this is always an issue that I have to do, I, and I guess I just want to mention it as a warning as much as a question, but, I mean, it doesn't, it's not that the, the individual, when, when I'm determining whether or not I have to do, uh, uh, send them a W-9 and do a 1099, you know, it's it's not whether or not they have a company name, it's whether or not they're incorporated or, or they're an individual, right? Correct. Uh, you know, if you're, say you have, uh, a partnership who's providing services for you, uh, whether it's design costs or anything like that, you still would have to issue them a 1099, I even though it's not an individual. All right, you know, so as long as it's not a corporation. Right, yeah, I think sometimes people, you know, because any individual might say, my name of my company is X, but, you know, you should check out because there's a good chance that, you know, they just are naming themselves a company and not necessarily... Uh, <clears throat> Incorporated. Um, 
So I think, I'm trying to think, what, what, you, I sent you the list. Was there anything else on the, the question? I feel like through all the chats, we've, we've hit them mostly. Was there anything else there that we didn't hit? Um, you know, in regards to, you know, because we do have, you know, there are a fair amount of uh, individuals that I, that I work with who are actually the designers. So they are receiving royalties for it. Oh, by the way, that was one other question. It was uh, royalties. So, you know, basically in, in that case, you would, even if you don't, say you don't set up a company, uh, an LLC or anything like that, you would still be filing as a sole proprietorship and filing Schedule C, which basically all that income from that schedule is reported on your 1040, and you can deduct any costs associated with you know, your design costs, or, you know, designing uh, the game in which you're, you're earning that income. So any type of office expenses that are associated with it, uh, any type of supplies that you're going to need for, for the design, you can use those expenses on your Schedule C to offset that, that income that you're receiving from uh, the company in which you help design the game. So right. that's, that's, a, that's a way of, 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 again, helping lessen the burden of, of that income. Uh, so, that, yeah, it would be a, a Schedule C item. Right. So, that was that was another question. I think, and as a, as a, as an individual designer, the value of understanding your taxes and understanding. I remember when I I wasn't in the board game space at the time, but I was doing a lot of contracting, and it wasn't just a couple hundred bucks. It was it was thousands of dollars. And looking at, ex, you know, company quote unquote company or work expenses and and your and your you know the space you're using and things like that. <coughs> Excuse me. It was. It was really useful um, and, oh, and valuable. I mean, I mean it, it, it's definitely you. You don't want to just if you got expenses associated with your 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 income, you know, from basically a self-employed individual. You definitely want to utilize that, you know. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, and that self-employment taxes—that's another huge topic, you know. So, uh, unfortunately, you know, when you if you're you know self-employed individual contractor. You're not just going to get hit with, you know, your federal income tax. You're going to have self-employment tax as well. Uh, right. Of course, half of that you can deduct, but that's just another tax that many individuals are not taxes. expecting. So, I mean, it's it's a tough one to explain as well, you know, because uh, in essence, I mean, you're you can be getting taxed at the highest rate, <coughs> and then, you know, for the first, you know, one hundred twenty-seven thousand. I believe 127,200 have to pay an additional 15.30, you know, so, yeah. uh, it's a tough one to explain, you know, uh, like I said, granted, you get a, you get a deduction for half of it, but no one really thinks about that. You know, they're just yeah. thinking about the extra tax they have to pay. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. then again, after a certain thresh, you know, threshold, uh, the social security portion phases out, uh, and then you just have the Medicare portion, but still, uh, a lot of additional taxes that are paid. Well, and, and something that I'll, I'll note, and, and actually we're coming on the 30-minute mark, so um, I'll probably be wrapping it up. But just, you know, when people are thinking about, well, it's a CPA, it's a, guy's, it's a company, do I have to spend all this money? Maybe I can do it on my own. I mean, there are always those options like in individual taxes. One of the things for me, I sort of offset it because I have you guys, and I, I don't know how common or uncommon, but as a sole proprietor LC. I have you guys do both my company taxes and my individual taxes, right? So I sort of, in my head, said, all right, well, if I sort of lump those two things together, uh, you know, I'll be a little bit more comfortable. And, and I, I feel like the sort of peace of mind and accuracy and, and, and services you guys have provided have really been, been worth it. But I do know, you know, for a lot of people, they just see it as a, another expense. And can I do this on my own? And I think you know, like any tax, I mean, you can do it on your own, right? So it's just, if you're going to do that, make sure you're learning everything you can about what you're supposed to do, right? You just, you're just, it's your time versus somebody else's time to know how to do it. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind, I think. Oh, yeah, I mean, that, that is a big thing. And, you know, I, I try to, to to explain to clients, you know, that the services that we provided are not just compliance only. You know, we are, you know, we are looking for, for ways to somehow improve your, your tax position. You know, we're, we're, we got plenty of resources here at, at my firm, and I'm sure other CPA firms do as well, where their job is not just to file your return. Their job is to, to look out for your best interests to help you save money. So, uh, you know, I know how individual, again, especially startups, you know, the money potentially is not there. 
to, to, to afford paying for a CPA and they want to do as much themselves, uh, which I, I do understand. So, uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, if I'm dealing with a brand new startup, I, I tell a lot of, you know, potential callers, you know, hey, yeah, if you have any questions, you know, and you're going to file the returns yourself, let me know, you know, and that, that offering there, you know, usually will, if, the, if that particular startup does end up succeeding, you know, the, the owners of that startup would be like, oh, yeah, I remember talking to Justin, and he gave us some, some free advice, you know, so now that we can afford a CPA, you know, they'll, they'll come back calling, and I'll get the opportunity to work with them. So, you know, a lot of startups, you know, I, I usually, if they have a few questions, and they just still, if they can't afford my services, I'm still always willing to, to give them the best advice that I can. Well, and, and to that end, presumably, but just to check, you're, you know, if, uh, if somebody's watching this and they're, they're ready for a CPA or they just had a good Kickstarter, um, you're still accepting clients, right? Oh, yes, definitely, definitely. <laughs> and again, and if, you know, they have, you know, if an individual has a few questions and they know that they're going to try to file their, their taxes themselves this year just because, like I said, startups, money's tight sometimes. You know, I am always available to, to answer a few questions, do the best I can, uh, in the hopes of, you know, in the future that, that business succeeding and, you know, potentially that client coming back to me. So, uh, like I said, I mean, we we strive to basically uh, do as much as we can for our clients. You know, I mean, like I said, stars are huge. You, you want to basically take uh, take into account and, and look out for the best interest of that sure. client. And, so, I, and I can certainly uh, attest to you guys doing that. I've really appreciated the services. So. Thanks for joining us uh, today, and I, I, I really, I, I hope everyone got at least some direction, some answers, or at least an idea of this world. Um, but, but thanks for coming on. Oh, well, thank you very much for having me. And, you know, I am always available for questions. You know, so if anybody has anything additional, any additional questions, or if there's something that I have not addressed, you know, definitely let me know. All right, sounds good. So, um, subscribe, share, all that good stuff. Most importantly, play some great games. Bye.